we have uh, been working on aptamers for about 10 years. And um, aptamers are DNA molecules. And they can be used uh, to selectively bind to antigens or targets. These could be viruses, for example, or bacteria, the same way that antibodies are used. Uh, except that antibodies are large proteins, uh, 250 kilodaltons, for example. So they're large. Uh, aptamers can be much smaller. Uh, they're typically 20, 20 or more DNA bases, which uh, are separated by roughly a third of a nanometer each. So you can have an aptamer that's only 10 nanometers, for example, long, and therefore it can selectively bind to a much smaller uh, entity, and in particular, it's well suited for binding to virus. So that's that's what I mean by aptamers, and of course we're using these aptamers for nanosensors. Uh, my co-authors here, uh, William Troy is a current PhD student, uh, uh, Shreya Ghosh just graduated, and George is a professor in pharmacy. Uh, Ingwa Chen is her PhD student, Double Palm Dada, Arsh Dabani are former, P former students in bioengineering. Uh, Chima was an undergraduate working in our lab. Uh, Sovik, uh, Kataki, Mochkin were uh, PhD students of my wife, uh, Mitra Dutta, who is listed at the very end, right before my name. Uh, together we run the Nano Engineering Research Lab. Uh, Young Yu uh, was a PhD student with Peter Burke at University of California at Irvine that has provided uh, many of our graphing platforms, which are platforms for our sensing. Xenia was a PhD student. Uh, Cedra is a postdoc, men, PhD student. Nilan was a PhD student, Sulvik was. Adam was a student of Paul Malchow, who's a professor in biology. Leah and Samuel were undergraduates. Milana was a PhD student. Mark Reed is at Yale, and uh, he, some of the, uh, Raman measurements, we rely on his substrates. And then Mitra Dutt is my wife. And we have, together we, uh, we have the Nano Engineering Research Lab at University of Illinois Chicago. Um, the, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this talk deals with aptamers, but we use those aptamers, these DN generally DNA or RNA aptamers, in conjunction with other nanostructures. Uh, in one case, uh, we bind the, the, the aptamer on one, end, one of its ends to a quantum dot, semiconductor quantum dot that's about 10 nanometers in diameter, can be 20 nanometers. And generally, we use luminescent quantum dots. So they emit radiation at a very specific color, depending on their size. And then on the other end of the aptamer, we can bind uh, a quencher, uh, usually a gold nanoparticle. And the, 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 the distance between the two ends of the DNA determines how much the gold nanoparticle affects the light output from the quantum dot. This is known as fluorescent resonant energy transfer or Forrester interaction. And uh, we'll talk about that later, but that's one mode. So these aptamer-based nanosensors um, uh, can have, we for many analytes, many targets we're trying to detect, we get into the picomolar sensitivity, uh, 10 to the minus 12 a mole. And um, the uh, examples so far of our targets are, ions, potassium, lead, calcium, IFN gamma, which is present in immune reactions, uh, an antibody, IgE, TNF alpha, uh, C-reactive protein. These are just examples. And we also do Raman studies uh, of these analytes as well as the, to determine the Raman signatures of the aptamers. 
So uh, just a little bit of a review. Um, uh, these nanosensors are based on aptamers. The aptamers are the active binding elements. They replace the antibodies. Uh, molecular beacon is a term used uh, when you simply have a, a DNA molecule, which is an aptamer, with a quantum dot bound to one end and a, a quencher bound to the other end. And when the DNA molecule binds to a target, it changes its shape, and therefore it changes the distance between the quantum dot and the quencher. And so the light from the quantum dot changes, and that gives you your signal uh, of a detection. Uh, we've also done that point two here on graphene substrates, um, and we'll talk about that. And then we've we've looked at Raman scattering, uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering, and uh, the uh, uh, Mitradata. My my uh, co-director uh, has been doing Raman scattering for, for decades, and uh, uh, we also look at the phonons involved in that. Um, so again, uh, the aptamers, mostly DNA, but also RNA are replacements for antibodies. They're especially suited for detecting small biomolecules. Um, this gives a, an illustration of various detection modes. Here we have a DNA origami which has nothing to do with the DNA aptamers. And on that, we have different carbon nanotubes. And then on each of these carbon nanotubes, we have bound aptamers. So these different aptamers will bind to different analytes. And so this is a, a concept for multiplex detection of analytes. This shows uh, a quantum dot, uh, a quencher, and then the aptamer is the black line. So, and, and these planes are planes where you could have ions, for example, potassium ions uh, are attracted to aptamers who form, form this conformational arrangement. And so in this configuration, the quencher and the quantum dot are close to each other and the, the light emitted by the quantum dot is greatly decreased. The energy that would, go, would come out as fluorescence is being coupled to the quencher, uh, basically as heat. And so the, there's less energy left for illumination, and so the signal decreases. This is yet another embodiment. Uh, here we have a graphene substrate with a source and a drain, as in a transistor. The aptamer is bound to the graphene, and then instead of having a quencher, we have a, an electron-rich molecule. Methylene blue is one. And so when the aptamer, when the target molecule is introduced, the aptamer changes its shape. And uh, if you have the right aptamer, the methylene blue will come close to the substrate. And so you get an electron uh, in the region between the source and the drain. So you get an enhanced current uh, as a, a signal of detection. Now, how do we find these aptamers? Uh, there's a well-developed technique called CELEX, uh, systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment that, <clears throat> that is used to discover what DNA molecules will bind to what targets. And you generally start with a library of about 10 to the 15 DNA molecules of a specific length. It could be 20 bases or 30 bases or 40 generally 20 to 50 bases, DNA bases is a good number for an aptamer. Uh, below 20, you don't get enough conformational change to get a good fluorescent resonant energy transfer signature. And above 50, the aptamers tend to get entangled with each other. So 50, 20 to 50 is a good number. So you start with these aptamers, and then you introduce your analytes and by keeping track of the aptamers that bind to the analytes, uh, you can identify the DNA molecules that bind. And then you can multiply those by the well-developed uh, PCR technique. Uh, due to all the investment in DNA technology over the decades, 
you can now multiply any DNA molecule with low cost. Uh, these aptamers have been used extensively in, in uh, biosensing. So here's a comparison of uh, aptamer properties to antibodies. The affinities, uh, I mentioned picomolar for some of our sensors. Antibodies, similar range. Specificity is high for both. Um, let me just highlight uh, the size. Uh, small molecules are possible with aptamers because aptamers are much smaller uh, than antibodies. Uh, tens of nanometers or 10 nanometers to hundreds of nanometers or aptamers and antibodies. Um, <clears throat> aptamers uh, can be used in reversible nanosensors. Um, the uh, antibodies generally bind, and that's it. You bind once. So aptamers have some, some differences. Um, the, I mentioned FRET before. Uh, the efficiency of the, of the exchange of the light energy to the quencher is known to go like one over R to the sixth. And uh, there's a separation where you have a 50% signal that's known as a Forster distance for the Forster radius uh, for the person who pioneered a lot of the work on FRET. If you have a, if you have a quantum dot near a gold surface, for example, you get a different dependence. It's one over R of the fourth, and we use both. But you can see that it's a very strong dependence, so you get a big change in the luminescence depending on the conformational change of the quencher. But this shows a typical aptamer with a quantum dot on one end and a quencher on the other end. Uh, the, the end of these uh, DNA, uh, the DNA molecule, we have complementary regions, so they tend to bind together. But when you introduce the target, the target will bind to a specific sequence of DNA bases, and then these bonds are broken, and this thing opens up, so you go from being very close, which is not much light, in this case, to being very far apart, which gives you a lot of light. The aptamer beacons can work both ways. You can start in an on state or you can start in an off state. This is an example where you start in an off state because the quantum dot and the quencher are close together. Um, <clears throat> here's some examples of aptamers uh, for cocaine. This particular sequence of DNA bases is known to bind. For potassium, this particular sequence. You see these quadruplexes, G quadruplexes. They are the regions that wrap around the potassium, uh, as in my first illustration of an aptamer. Lead, this sequence, IgE is another sequence. IFN gamma, we, we, were get, we got down to a limit of 83 picomolars for that. This is a good aptamer for IFN gamma. Generally, you find for most analytes that you're trying to detect, that there's several aptamers which you can use. Uh, uh, when you do the selects, you find several candidates. Usually one seems to be the best, but there are others. ATP, which is used in, in uh, humans for energy storage, uh, will bind to this aptamer. Uh, TFN gamma, this aptamer. C-reactive protein, which, which occurs in allergic reactions uh, or irritation, uh, this particular aptamer. So here's some other uh, analytes that are known, that we have known aptamers for. It's been a cell-X process. So some of these are pretty interesting, uh, including, uh, and some of the, we've looked at quite a few of these in our lab. Uh, I'll say a little bit about aptamers that are known to bind to uh, COVID-1 and 2. Uh, in fact, here they are. Uh, uh, the Initial work on this was done by these authors, and they've identified aptamers which bind to COVID-1. Uh, there, there are different proteins in the COVID, N proteins, S proteins, the spike proteins that uh, the aptamers bind to. These are known to bind to uh, um, COVID-2. And it turns out that some of these aptamers uh, in the 
for the COVID-1 are also, will also bind to the COVID-2. So uh, these are known aptamers. Some of these are a little long, okay? So um, the, the uh, maybe actually getting on the upper limit of what would be desired, but they're still, still close to that number of about 50 DNA bases. This is work done by uh, Kevin Plaxco and Alan Heger. Um, uh, I think you know Heger from uh, Conductive Polymers, won the Nobel Prize uh, with McDermott and Shirakawa. Uh, so this shows uh, an aptamer with a, an electron-rich molecule, could be methylene blue on a gold substrate. And then when you introduce this biomolecule, this protein, platelet-derived growth factor, it, it binds to the aptamer. The aptamer changes its conformational shape. This electron gets close to the substrate. You get a current. So it's electrical output. Um, an interesting thing here uh, from Heger uh, and Plaxco's group uh, this particular sequence of DNA molecules will bind to the platelet-derived growth factor. But this one will not. There's only a small change here. In fact, you can, in many cases, you just change one or two bases and you no longer bind. So why is it that, it's, that a certain sequence of bases will bind to a certain analyte? Well, it just is. It just... Uh, uh, the electrostatics of the binding site are such that a particular sequence will bind efficiently and another one won't. Uh, I don't think um, first principles calculations of this are, are really readily available. So it's an empirical thing. And the afterwards selected by CELEX. Uh, this shows some of our work on detecting potassium. Uh, here we have Gold quenchers are aptamers, quantum dot. Uh, we go from zero moles to uh, one picomole is a red signature to 100 millimolar. And you can see as you increase the concentration, the fluorescence decreases. So these can serve as a calibration curve. And, um, and then you can detect the concentration of your analyte. In this case, it's potassium. Um, this shows more on the electrical output. This, this I had on one of the first charts. If you introduce cocaine, uh, identified the cocaine aptamer earlier, I won't go back, it will bind, and the aptamer, and that particular aptamer changes its conformational shape to donor and electron. So these are IV curves for, uh, that we obtained for that detection of cocaine on a gold gold substrate. Uh, you can explain that with a charge sheet conductance model. Now, uh, in working with our colleague Peter Burke at the University of California at Irvine, uh, we had the opportunity to use graphene substrates. And uh, they fabricate a graphene substrate and then deposit Looks like a bathtub here of PDMS, uh, which is a, a silicon containing uh, polymer that is biocompatible on the graphene. And on one end of the graphene, deposit a silver paste, on the other end, a silver paste. And so, this little bathtub area you can fill with water or an electrolyte, and you bind your aptamers to the bottom of that. So, it's like a bathtub. And then when your analyte comes in, it causes a conformational change in the aptamers, which causes a redistribution of charge, uh, which gives you a, a current voltage signature. And it's very sensitive. Uh, the aptamer does not have to change its conformation very much. So that's an advantage of this electrical output as opposed to the optical output I talked about earlier. So this is a side view of the uh, of the uh, PDMS graphene uh, uh, arrangement, basically the same as this up in the upper upper right. Uh, we've also done the same thing by depositing electrodes 
on uh, graphene on silicon dioxide, and we can we can pattern uh, we can pattern electrodes. These substrates uh, have been uh, fabricated at the Army Research Lab in Adelphi, Maryland, and we have we've used this type of substrate as well. Um, the uh, that that work is reported in this, this, this uh, publication. Here we're using the beacons of this type. And so uh, you, again, you can see there your signal changes as you change the concentration. OK, this shows. Uh, Essentially, molecular beacon bound to some uh, inert substrate or uninvolved substrate. The idea is just to collect a lot of beacons on a substrate. In this case, it's origami or graphene oxide. The basic detection mechanism is still the analyte binds to the aptamer, and then the gold changes its distance from the quantum dot, and that gives you fret. Uh, this is an example of the carbon of the graphene uh, sensors with the PDMS, uh, I call them a bathtub, where your analytes are, are detected in the bathtub. And you have your aptamers. And then when your targets bind to the aptamers, you get a conformational change. And so you have a voltage between your source and the drain, uh, I'm sorry, current between the source and the drain. And there's a voltage here using an, uh, uh, an electrolytic probe that goes down into your water or your electrolyte. And that potential changes uh, when you introduce an analyte that causes the aptamers to change their conformational shape because you change the charge distribution. Um, this is for interfering gamma, IgE. Um, we, again, we've gotten into the peaker molar range for a lot of these analytes. Uh, this shows two nanomolar for IFN gamma. Uh, uh, ATP is another one we've studied. Um, uh, this, this shows for ATP, the detection curves down to 10, 10 picomolar. And uh, this has been used by other people to detect uh, mercury in muscles. So the, uh, the uh, it's possible to do this detection in the so-called dirty, dirty environment. Let me jump ahead quickly to the re work of a recent PhD graduate, Shreya Ghosh. Um, uh, she's now at her UIUC in Urbana. Uh, this shows uh, the detection of calcium using quantum dot aptamer beacons. And the interesting part about this is the calcium is inside of a cell. So we have to get our molecular beacons in the cell. And we do that using a sequence of DSS peptides. The DSS peptides basically will drag our molecular beacons through the cell membrane, the bilipid membrane that protects the cell. Uh, this is also done uh, by the, the TAT uh, peptide in the case of HIV. It's the TAD peptide that drags the HIV through the bilipid layer. And you can see here, uh, as calcium increases, the fluorescence from the quantum dot decreases. This is a function of time. Uh, this release is being, the calcium release is being stimulated with a TG. And um, these are done on uh, preostocyte cells, mouse cells. Um, another example. Uh, this is detecting TFN alpha, again, with the D DSS peptide. And uh, uh, you, this is for healthy cells. This is for infected cells. The infected cells have elevated levels of TNF uh, alpha. And you see there's less fluorescence uh, from the quantum dots in the case of the infected cells, which produce the TNF alpha, and the, what's happening is that the aspers are binding to the TN, TNF alpha in the cells. We've also used this to study 
uh, we use quantum knots and with laser radiation to study uh, gating of ion channels in neurons and cells. They're channels which allow the ions to go in and out that are voltage gated, um, uh, mechanical gating, or chemical gating. This is the case of a voltage gated. So we take our quantum knots and we use a laser to create a dipole moment. That electric field is enough to switch the ion channel from on to off. Um, we've also looked at using semiconductors which have built-in spontaneous polarizations for that. Uh, that has not been as productive as we wanted because you have to figure out how to align the quantum dot uh, relative to the ion channel. So it's that this, the C axis of the quantum dot is in the right position. Uh, I think I probably don't have time to discuss this very much. We do Raman scattering. This shows the four DNA bases. There are many different normal modes. This shows a normal mode, which is a breathing mode. You have a ring here, and they all vibrate out together, and then they vibrate in. So it's like a donut breathing. There are many different normal modes in the, the DNA bases, and each normal mode has a characteristic frequency or a phonon frequency. And um, we, we use SIRS to enhance that. We also assemble our DNA molecules that we're going to study about Raman scattering on a substrate by binding them to the substrate so that the incoming laser in the Raman experiment is interacting with many molecules and not just one. Um, so here's an example of uh, a stimulant for Bacillus subtilis. It's a stimulant because you, you have the same ratio of C to G as A to T as you do in the real, uh, in the real bacterium, which has 40 million base pairs. And we, we make our own SIRS substrates by assembling uh, metallic uh, dots on a, on a polystyrene uh, uh, substrate. We deposit polystyrene beads, then we coat them uh, with silver or gold, and they give us our little nanostructures which enhance the Raman. The enhancement can be a factor of 10 to the seven, uh, or even 10 to the eight, what happens is the, the Raman light creates a plasmon in the nanometal. That plasmon has electric fields, which are much greater than those of the laser. So effectively, the, the incoming Raman uh, pump is amplified by the plasmon contribution. So this, uh, this shows typical uh, uh, Raman spectrum. This is the intensity, which is always, almost always given in an arbitrary units. It shows the wave number in centimeters. It's the same as wave vector except for a factor of two pi. Uh, Raman spectroscopy is generally use wave number instead of wave vectors. And so it's, uh, two, uh, it's just one over the wavelength of the light. Uh, in this particular case, um, the uh, we had an eight milliwatt laser and we illuminate for varying times. Um, uh, we've also worked with Mark Reed at Yale who has fabricated substrates uh, of silver positive by E-beam and we put our biomolecules on that substrate. And here's, here's a particular uh, DNA strand that we studied for, uh, again, for the, uh, Bacillus subtilis, and again, we get the Raman spectrum for that. You can see the, the lines look different uh, as you change your substrate and the SIRS. Um, this is more with the marked substrates. We've also studied um, thymosin, the SIRS spectrum of thymosin, which occurs if you have a throat cancer, the thymosin appears in elevated levels in that case. Uh, this shows some of the vibrational modes in the thymosin that we detect. This shows the SIRS compared with the Raman in the various peaks. Well, the Raman serves as a, as a fingerprint. Uh, this gives more details on those. We can also study BZ transitions. Um, and 
Uh, DNA molecules can come in a right-handed helix or a left-handed helix. And uh, you can, one is a B DNA, the other is called Z DNA. And uh, you can, by changing the concentration of the electrolyte where the DNA molecules are stored, you can go from right-handed to left-handed. And so this shows lines, uh, our Ramat measurements for B DNA, again, for B DNA. This is for Z DNA. Uh, you see similar lines. These are the Ramad peaks that correspond to the different normal modes of vibration. Uh, this is also ZDNA. Here's a comparison. And our, this is probably a real difference, 240 to 232. The, this particular Raman setup had a resolution of about two inverse centimeters. These, these units here are inverse centimeters. This is probably not a real difference as this. Um, uh, this is a real difference. So we see a slight shift in the vibrational mode frequency as we undergo a conformational change from the Z DNA to the B DNA. So the, uh, the, the technique is that refined. You can, you can use it to study conformational change in a molecule. Um, so I think, uh, I think I should stop here and ask for questions. Or I can discuss more about any particular area. Well, thank you.